This program is rated PG and may contain mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. Our world is literally buzzing with bees and bugs. Insects such as butterflies, beetles, flies, and moths, as well as arachnids, including spiders and scorpions. They come in a profusion of shapes, sizes, colors, and functions. An alien looking down on this planet might well think that this is the planet of the insects. There is 900,000 described species. They are integral to every single ecosystem on this planet. But they're the Rodney Dangerfield of our ecosystem. They don't get no respect. We often think of insects as pests, but there are a lot of essential workers in nature, especially when it comes to insects. Without pollinating insects, human beings and most of the Earth's creatures would be at risk of starvation. Today, we're going to look at the incredible impact bees and bugs have on our planet by imagining a world where the gifts from insects are wiped away. We're conducting a thought experiment where one by one, we're going to remove the vital jobs the world's creepy crawlers and flying swarms do for us. If we did not have insects, we would be knee deep in feces and dead animals. We rely on bees and bugs for our very survival. This is history erased. The world without bees, bugs, and spiders. We tend to think of insects as the good, the bad, or the ugly. They can frighten and annoy us, but they are absolutely essential to the planet's well-being and ours. There are about 1.4 billion insects for every person on the planet. In today's thought experiment, we'll follow these amateur entomologists or insect investigators and their families as their lives are impacted by the loss of bees and bugs and their gifts to the world, starting with our history and culture. Bees are really a cornerstone species. They're essentially wasps turned vegetarian, and this happened about 120 million years ago. The earliest record of humans keeping bees in artificial hives was found in the Sun Temple erected in 2400 BCE near Cairo. The ancient Egyptians cherished bees and honey, and bees often symbolized royalty. Bees were in fact sacred, said to have sprung from the tears of the weeping sun god Ra as they fell to earth. One of the most common hieroglyphs you see carved into the tombs and buildings there are pictures of bees or of bee hives. Gifts from bees also hold a special place in religious traditions, from Judaism to Islam. One unique substance has both medicinal and some would even say spiritual properties. For centuries and even until today, the Gurung people of Nepal have been harvesting a very special kind of honey. Some plants put toxins into their nectar. If bees make honey from visiting rhododendron flowers, it has such concentrations of these toxins that it can actually make people hallucinate. With a lot of cultures in the world, hallucinogenics are important in cultural activities and rituals. A more common and widespread intoxicating substance derived from the labor of bees is mead. Mead is uh, one of the earliest alcoholic drinks. Also known as the nectar of the gods by the Greeks, mead dates back until at least 7,000 BC. When we think about the Vikings, or when we think about the Canterbury Tales, the tales of bravery of old, they're often alcohol fuel. It almost certainly, in most cases, was mead. The beeswax honeycomb itself has also been prized throughout history. When someone says, mind your own beeswax, you should be so lucky. Beeswax is a billion dollar industry. It was used to seal the hulls of boats thousands of years ago. It's highly flammable, and as such, human beings very quickly figured out that it can be used to make candles. Beeswax candles have been around for eons, right, and very, very important. Ancient Rome was likely the birthplace of wicked candles using beeswax or melted fat. The Romans brightened their homes, lit up the night, and illuminated sacred ceremonies. Candle clocks became an early timekeeping innovation. Once Christianity was established, that really increased the demand for beeswax. Before electricity, candles were the cleanest form of nighttime lighting. And it has like one of the nicest scents ever. 
The only rival to the bee as humanity's bug benefactor may be the slinky silkworm. Silk has been prized in China for at least 4,800 years. Silk is obtained from the silk moth. The caterpillar, when it's fully grown, uh, spins a cocoon. Each cocoon can contain up to a thousand feet of silken thread. The cocoons are harvested and that is turned into fabric. We desired it for making textiles and huge trade routes built up between the West and the East. The Silk Road was a series of trade routes from China to the Mediterranean that was around from 300 to 1500 AD. The development of these trade routes had huge repercussions for human culture. Marco Polo certainly wrote about and brought back silk, but he also brought back spices, the science of astronomy. Everything from calligraphy to martial arts to religious ideas. But number one in importance, as far as we were concerned in the West, was getting silk, an insect product, out of the East. As silkworms provided the silk for textiles, another insect allowed humans to dye those textiles in rich shades of red. Cochineal is a bright red pigment, uh, which is actually extracted from insects that live on cacti in Central America. It was the holy grail of the textile industry was to find that bright red color of human blood. Cochineal was brought back to Europe by uh, the Spanish after they'd conquered parts of the Americas. Everything became that bright red color. European finery, the original American flag, the red stripes was cochineal insect dye. It was the best red dye for painters. Van Gogh had a fondness for bright red. So did Rembrandt, and so did Rubens. Cochineal is still used to dye the dress uniforms of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, in cosmetics such as lipstick, and even as a natural food dye. Some insects give us a bounty of goods, and others simply bewitch us with their beauty. While most insects people find slightly repulsive, there are a few exceptions to that rule, and the classic example would be butterflies. The butterfly has also penetrated our collective consciousness as a powerful metaphor known as the butterfly effect. The term butterfly effect was coined by MIT meteorologist Edward Lorenz. Lorenz first postulated in a 1972 paper whether a butterfly flapping its wing in Brazil might lead down the road to a tornado in Texas. Lorenz's flapping butterfly is a symbol representing the unpredictability of interactions in complex systems. In essence, a very small event can have a massive impact elsewhere. Edward Lorenz's chaos theory has been applied in fields from anthropology to physics in ways Lorenz himself couldn't have predicted. Through the ages, spiders and insects have inspired many forms of cultural and creative expression. Anansi, the spider, is a key figure in West African folklore. A trickster god, Anansi is also the keeper of stories. The ancient Egyptians uh, considered the, the scarab beetle to be sacred. They often had in the hieroglyphics on the, on the burial chambers, like etched in dung beetles, and beautiful ornate rings. Some dung beetles roll really neat balls of dung and roll them backwards to a point where they bury them. And the ancient Egyptians saw this as kind of representing the sun going across the sky each day. What they don't notice is that the female will lay an egg into that dung ball. Out comes an adult scarab beetle. And it's like, wow, life after death. So now they thought by putting scarab beetles all over their burial chamber that they would live again. While insects and arachnids have made their mark on science and culture, they've also influenced science fiction and pop culture. Insects are like aliens on Earth. Dan O'Bannon, the screenwriter for the original Alien film, he didn't have to make up a horrific monster Thousands of species of parasitoid insect have this rather gruesome life cycle where the female injects her eggs into a, a living host and the offspring 
live inside until they're fully grown themselves. And then they burst out, just like in the movie. Dragonfly nymphs have a jaw, a lower labor that juts out, spears the prey, and then pulls it in. No matter how nasty an alien you try to create in science fiction, Mother Nature beat you to it. Stan Lee is responsible for so many of our iconic superheroes. Where does that creative genius come from? He was sitting in his office and watching a fly climbing up a wall. Flies have dense hairs on the last segments of the leg, and these dense hairs give great friction, so they're able to adhere to surfaces. So he sees this and goes, wow. And he started running through names before Spider-Man came to him, and suddenly he realized that's it. Many spiders are friendly, depending on your neighborhood, but most people will do whatever they can to avoid an insect close encounter. But our world would be changed for the worse if bugs began to disappear. Now, as we begin our thought experiment, we'll strip away the important cultural gifts and innovations from bees, bugs, and spiders we would be robbed of a lot of cultural history, a lot of storytelling. Without honeybees and their beeswax, a whole industry would dry up. The loss of beeswax candles would literally plunge much of our history and many of our customs into darkness. We wouldn't have all of the cross-pollination between East and West that came out of the silkworm-fueled Silk Road trade. Human cultures would be a lot less connected. Losing the cultural gifts from bees and bugs would be a sad day. But losing the critters that make up our food supply would be a much bigger problem. As our thought experiment continues, the Friends Adventure will become much more troubled by the loss of insect-derived food. Insects, like bees, play an important role in our culture, but they're also a vital link in the food chain. The western honeybee, which is Apis mellifera, produces 1.6 million tons of honey annually, which is valued at about $8 billion. I absolutely love honey. It's essentially sweetened nectar from flowers, and it's the winter larder of the honeybee. It's thought that human beings domesticated honeybees during the Neolithic period. And of course, we learned many thousands of years ago that honey was delicious, and we've been stealing it from them ever since. Some of the oldest foods we've ever found was from the Egyptian tombs was honey, and it's still perfectly edible, which is amazing. Honey keeps essentially forever. It has a very low moisture content, high sugar content, and it also gives off hydrogen peroxide, which makes it an inhospitable environment for bacteria and yeast. Creating this golden goodness is labor intensive, and it all begins at a flower. While honeybees fly from flower to flower, they drink nectar with their long tongue, which they then bring back to the beehive in their honey stomach. Bees can carry three quarters of their own body weight in pollen and nectar back to the nest on each return. They use the heat of the hive and their wings to evaporate off the water. This transforms the nectar, which is mostly water, into honey, which is mostly sugar. Honey is an important sweetener in many food items. But in much of the world, insects themselves are the main course. There are over 2,000 species of insect in more than 130 countries that are eaten by people. Roughly 80% of the world's population routinely eat insects. It's really just relative when you think about it. Eating a steak and eating a bowl of larva is really not that different. In Mexico, chapelines, which are grasshoppers, are sold by street vendors in brown paper bags seasoned with spices. The Mopani caterpillar is a South African caterpillar, which is hugely important in the diets of many millions of people. In Sardinia and Corsica, some people enjoy a traditional goat's milk cheese. My wife is appalled that I'll eat blue cheese, which has living mold in it. That's nothing compared to kazu marzu, 
actually has live maggots in it. Even spiders are sometimes consumed. In South America, the indigenous people will catch some of the large bird-eating spiders. Insects and spiders may be a protein source for humans, but perhaps no creature eats more bugs than their fellow insects. One of the most important things insects do for us is they act as biocontrol agents. Ladybirds, lacewings, hoverflies, earwigs, soldier beetles, parasitic wasps. Without those predatory insects, we would be overrun by all sorts of agricultural pests. Some insect predators have evolved senses that to us seem literally superpowered. Perhaps the most impressive vision in the insect world is that of uh, dragonflies. They have these big compound eyes, 28,000 lenses on each. But the coolest thing is that they see in slow motion. They have super fast neurons which give them super fast reactions and they need that because they snatch flies and other flying insects out of midair. In fact, they can capture about 95% of their prey. A key bug in the food chain is one many of us know all too well. Mosquitoes are an enormously important food source for many species of birds, such as swallows and swifts and martins. And then the nighttime comes, and now you have a new predator coming out, bats. And bats absolutely adore and have specialized to eating mosquitoes by the thousands every single night. Insects are the very base of the food chain, so all the larger animals depend on insects in order to survive. And there are many herbivorous insects that feed on plant material, and they then in turn are preyed upon by larger insects, by birds or frogs. There's actually a bird that is specifically adapted to eating bees. It'll catch the bee in midair, take it down, and then scratch its stinger on a, on a branch so that it releases its venom before eating it. Spiders are a different group from insects. They're arachnids, and they are specialized predators. Some spiders, in turn, elevate pest control into an art form. I like to keep spiders in my house because I know that they're going to be nibbling on all the smaller insects for dinner. You either have free-ranging predators, like jumping spiders, that actively hunt and kill insect prey. Then you've got silken nest builders, and they let the prey come to them. Spiders eat 400 to 800 million tons of insects every single year. They actually consume the weight of humanity on this planet every year. How's that for a sobering thought? Spiders can be found almost anywhere, but no critter is more widespread than the ant. Ants are among the most ecologically important of all insects. They help to keep the soil aerated and healthy. They disperse plant seeds. Ants are renowned for their strength, able to carry objects 50 times their body weight. But it's their strength in numbers that makes them a literal force of nature. There is thousands in a colony. Ants have to be the king or the queen as, you, as who's you know, running the colony. As our thought experiment continues, we're going to strip away pest control from bugs and the many foods derived from insects. It would be a devastating reality to live in one that wasn't sweet with honey. Without predatory and parasitic insects, we would be just overrun by pest species that affect our crops and our well-being on this planet. It's one of the, the key uh, mechanisms that helps us to grow healthy crops around the world. If the world lost its edible insects, there would be a huge malnutrition problem for millions of people around the world. Birds, small mammals, fish, uh, frogs, all sorts of creatures depend on insects as their main source of food that ripples all the way up the food chain because the larger animals feed on the smaller ones. Most food chains would simply fall apart. Along with pests, diseases such as malaria, West Nile, and Zika virus would also run unchecked. Without these predators and parasites of mosquitoes, we would have millions more human deaths every year. Global ecosystems are strained to the breaking point as their fragile balance is upended. 
but the crisis will deepen when we remove bees and bugs gifts to medicine and science. Without insects providing food, our world falls into crisis and hunger. It's just one of those cascading events that has no positive outcome. As our thought experiment continues, we're turning over the rock on some of the most vital contributions bees and bugs make to science, health, and technology. From China to India, Africa, Latin America, all of these places have used insects for their medicinal properties. In 2020, Oxford University research showed evidence that honey, a long-used home remedy, may be better and safer for coughs and colds than over-the-counter medicines. Honey has a, an antibacterial property, which means that it's very useful as a wound dressing. At the Battle of Shrewsbury in 1403, the future King Henry V was shot in the head with an arrow. In the Middle Ages, any wound was liable to infection, and infection could be fatal. Honey was applied to the wound, preventing infection and saving his life. Henry V became a symbol of military success and inspired William Shakespeare. The most famous line from Henry V, once more unto the breach. The reason there was once more is thanks to honey. In addition to bees, other insects provide an incredible array of medical and scientific benefits. Bioprospecting is essentially looking for useful compounds in nature. Insects have the potential to be enormously valuable to us as a source of drugs and chemicals. The oldest and most common way flu vaccines are produced is by using an egg-based process, but there may be a better option we've discovered that we can create and incubate vaccines in insect proteins. We can produce the vaccine in quantity much more quickly. Ants live in very high density colonies and that makes it very easy for disease to spread. So they've had to evolve a whole series of antimicrobial compounds. As study subjects, some of the tiniest bugs have made a huge impact on medical science. Fruit flies are great model organisms for research because they have such a short lifespan and because they reproduce so quickly. It's from egg to adult in like 11 days in the right conditions. We can observe evolution in a matter of weeks or days instead of centuries and millennia. Thomas Hunt Morgan was the preeminent biologist studying fruit flies in the early 1900s. He was the first to show that genes are located on chromosomes. They have large chromosomes that can be easily seen under a microscope. They look completely different to us, but actually 60% of our DNA is exactly the same as that of fruit flies. Fruit fly research has led to Nobel Prize winning breakthroughs, including Morgan's, and has enabled advances in treating cancer, autism, diabetes, and more. Insects have provided us with medical knowledge, but as disease carriers, they can also be extremely harmful, particularly those that would use us as a source of food. Flies, fleas, and lice are all vectors of disease, especially the Black Plague, which was spread by fleas. The bacterium Yersinia pestis, which causes the bubonic plague, killed between a quarter to half of the population in 14th century Europe possibly 200 million people. During World War II, Polish biologist Rudolf Stefan Jan Weigel invented the first effective vaccine against epidemic typhus. Weigel kept his lab open, employing people from the groups that the Nazis hated, used their blood to feed lice, and the lice developed the typhus material that was used to make a vaccination. Weigel's actions saved an estimated 5,000 people from the grip of the Nazis. Mosquitoes are also a major disease carrier, easily spreading infection with their bloodthirsty bites. Perhaps the most dangerous animal on the planet in terms of causing human deaths is the mosquito. The world's 3,000 species of mosquitoes transmit more diseases than any other creature. Zika virus is the latest, but yellow fever and malaria that kills 
millions of people every year. So you're far more likely to be killed by an insect than by a shark or a tiger or a lion. Insect-borne diseases are terrible, but we may make progress by studying how some bugs are themselves resistant to infection. The cockroach lives in some of the most filthy, dirty environments. I mean, laden with bacteria. Cockroaches have evolved natural antibiotics to survive in such extreme conditions. We are looking at their immune system responses to see if we can glean any information that may help us as humans fighting infections. Insects also contribute to human well-being by inspiring cutting-edge technology. Biomimicry is where scientists and engineers are inspired by nature. When you think of insects, the whole body is a tubular structure. The legs are all hollow, filled with muscles and nerves. Well, scientists have been studying cockroach legs because they have very springy and flexible limbs, and that might actually help people be able to design better robots with a better grasp. Now, as we continue our thought experiment and release bug-inspired science and medicine, our health and well-being are in sudden jeopardy. Many prosthetics and advanced elastics that are inspired by insects, those would all disappear. If we'd never had fruit flies, our understanding of the way DNA is passed from generation to generation would be set back by decades. As vital bug-derived medicines and inoculations stop working, illness hits our unsuspecting population. By studying insects, we've gained an enormous amount of scientific and medical knowledge. Where would we be without that? This mother and daughter struggle to overcome the terrible fallout as the vital contributions from bees and bugs continue to vanish from our world. Insects are valuable to science and medicine and as a direct source of food, but they are vital to the planet's complex life cycle. Insects were the first animals to develop flight over 350 million years ago. Flight gave bugs a huge advantage in finding food, locating a mate, escaping predators, and finding new habitats. Flying insects may have turbocharged plant evolution, with plants rapidly evolving different flower shapes, colors, scents, and rewards to attract visitors. One of the most important ecological roles that insects perform is as pollinators. About 80% of plant species are angiosperms or flowering plants, and those plants require insects to be pollinated. Bees, butterflies, beetles, flies, there's a whole host of insects that pollinate plants. The global crops directly relying on pollinators are valued at close to half a trillion dollars US per year. Bees are one of the most important groups of insects because of their role in pollination. They are covered in fur. When they fly through the air, they get a static charge, which allows the pollen to stick to their bodies. Don't forget, pollen is their protein source. They collect their pollen on the hind legs. The workers can easily strip out this pollen basket and boom, then that worker can go off and collect more pollen. They're really small, but mighty. Honeybees do about 80% of the insect pollinating of plants that we rely on. From coffee to wine to fruits and vegetables, so much of our daily food relies on insects. Apples, oranges, peaches, watermelons, you name it, bees probably pollinated it. Tomatoes are almost entirely dependent on bumblebees because the flowers have to be vibrated to get the pollen to drop out. Bumblebees are a, a bigger bee and they can do something called buzz pollination. They bite the flowers and they buzz their flight muscles and shake the, the pollen out. And they're actually used in greenhouses for that purpose. As a testament to their importance, honeybees really are considered a livestock animal. And every winter, California is home to the largest working bee community on the planet. In Northern California, they grow 80% of all the almonds in the world. Those trees only bloom in February, and the rest of the year, there's not a lot there to support the native pollinators. Two million beehives, each containing maybe 50,000 bees, are transported to California just to pollinate the almonds. 
But there are concerns about this industrial scale use of bees. Honeybees aren't really evolved to be moved around on transport trucks. They can trade diseases with each other, they can spread parasites. And if anything were to happen to that supply of honeybees, then the almond industry would collapse. Everybody loves butterflies. They're beautiful, but they're also incredibly important pollinators. Monarch butterflies are one of the more iconic butterflies found in North America. Monarchs are the only butterfly that migrate like birds, pollinating wildflowers along the way. The ones that hibernate in Mexico set off flying northwards and their offspring fly further north. And now three or four generations, they can have moved up into Canada, 5,000 kilometers. When autumn sets in, they fly back to exactly where they came from. But this can be the great grandchildren of the butterfly that set off. It's one of the most extraordinary things that's never been completely explained by science. Despite their wide range and universal appeal, the monarch is in trouble. Sadly, monarch butterfly populations have collapsed in recent decades. And it's thought to be a combination of factors, logging of the forests where they overwinter, the use of herbicides. And there's also concern that climate change is adding to the problem. Beyond food, Pollination is essential for many other plants, and some important bug species may crawl under our radar. The very first pollinators were probably beetles, long before bees even existed, perhaps 200 million years ago. A third of all insects are a beetle. They pollinate about 88% of the 240,000 different plant species that require pollination. Some eat the pollen for protein, but they're all there for mostly the nectar, that, that high energy carbohydrate effects. Today, there are thousands of species of beetle that contribute to pollination of both wildflowers and of crops. Sometimes a specific plant bug relationship evolves that hits a sweet spot for humans. Chocolate is pollinated by a tiny midge closely related to the little midges that bite you. The cacao plant has a very tiny, very intricately structured flower. So they're entirely dependent on these miniature flies for pollination. Through the mists of time comes a legendary origin of another beloved vice, courtesy of a tiny wee insect. As a scotch drinker, I do appreciate this story. There is a small fly that helps pollinate heather. And of course, heather is just widespread, beautiful flower in the Scottish countryside. Legend has it in 325 BC, heather ale, which was made from the heather plant, was brought indoors and heated. And then apparently there was some condensation dripping from the ceiling and they had that taste of heather. And they discovered that through this distillation process, a whole new drink had been invented. It is ironic, such a small little species of fly has really created on Earth a multi-billion dollar industry of scotch whiskey. But now, as we continue our thought experiment, we strip away pollination from our wonderful bees and bugs. A world without butterflies would be less beautiful and a heck of a lot less pollinated. Without the pollination of insects, no chocolate, no whiskey. We wouldn't have an enormous number of fruits and vegetables. When you have this many people on the planet, even a drop in production is gonna be catastrophic. It would be nearly impossible to produce food. The world as we know it wouldn't exist. Without them, our food supplies would plummet. All animal species would be at risk. That would be a major, major problem. Without the pollination of insects, our world falls into panic and hunger. It would be a humanitarian disaster. Without them, we starve to death. As our troubled world reels with the loss of many of the crucial benefits of bees and bugs, our thought experiment crawls towards its conclusion with one painfully ugly insect industry. Many insects have evolved defenses to try and avoid being eaten, for example, stings. I was stung once, only once, by a bee. I've been stung countless times. The most painful thing I've ever been stung by are fire ants. It feels like you're being burned when they 
sting you. Entomologist Dr. Justin Schmidt developed a sting index that ranks the severity of an insect sting on a scale from one to four. He's traveled the world and deliberately got stung by as diverse a range of stinging insects as he could find. Honeybees rank around a two. So naturally, people want to know, what's the worst? There were two winners, the bullet ant and the tarantula hawk wasp, both of which essentially leave you lying on the ground screaming. The bullet ant from Central and South America on the Schmidt sting scale, it's a four plus, the highest level ever given. He describes as the pain feeling like walking over hot coals with a rusty nail in through your foot. Because of his scale, Dr. Schmidt is now known as the king of sting. He also did a separate study to work out which body part was most sensitive when stung. The two places that were most painful are the tip of the nose and the tip of the penis. Some of the ugliest bug work has actually been harnessed by doctors on the battlefield and in modern hospitals. Flies are attracted to dead flesh and they lay their eggs. The maggots will eat the gangrenous flesh that is in any open wound. This seemingly nasty discovery was a lifesaver. Napoleon's army used maggots to clean wounds. They noticed people that had maggots in the wounds had less bacterial infection and disease and had a greater chance of survival. In World War I, a physician named William Baer often employed maggots in the treatment of battlefield injuries. And they'll clean out the dead, rotting tissue very effectively and help the wound to heal up. Even in modern medicine, for persistent infections and necrotic diseases, maggots are used. Bugs on dead flesh also give valuable information to forensic scientists. With forensic entomology, you can count backwards and you can get the time of death, which is very important in any kind of murder or sudden death. But insects play a much more vital role than cleaning wounds or identifying time of death. They clean our planet. If a tree dies or a leaves fall or an animal dies or a cow produces a cow pad, all of those materials rapidly attract different types of insects. Dealing with the dung is important, but so is sorting out all the dead bodies. Carrion is essentially a dead body, a carcass, and most animals don't eat carrion. That is largely the domain of insects. There's a whole wonderful sequence of insects that approach any dead animal. The first on the scene, the blowflies and the ants. They can sniff out a source of food and get there really quickly. They start eating that rotten flesh. Within just a few hours, the corpse is beginning to be dismantled by a busy team of insects. When the body's almost skeletal, that's when the centipedes and the slugs and the cockroaches come and they finish the decomposition work. As we reach the finale of our thought experiment and remove one final crucial service that insects provide, we lose all the decomposition work that bugs do for us. If they weren't constantly cleaning out the mess of this world, we would literally be knee deep in decaying material. We would have a big problem with feces. And of course, with feces, you get bacterial growth and you get disease. We would be living in an incredibly unsanitary environment that would essentially lead to a global crisis. Disposing of dead bodies, that's bug work. We would have rotting, festering, disease-laden carcasses all over the place. It would pretty much look like a zombie movie. As our world descends into chaos, hunger and filth without bees and bugs, the stench of death and fear hangs in the air, crippling the global population and our young friends. Without insects to decompose dead things, the world would be truly apocalyptic. The importance of insects was put best, perhaps, by uh, an American biologist, E.O. Wilson, who said that if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. And he's absolutely right. 
Today, in our thought experiment, the world has suffered as we removed fundamental roles of bees and bugs from our planet. Are you okay? To chaos, hunger, and filth without bees and bugs, the stench of death and fear hangs in the air, crippling the global population and our young friends. Thankfully for these friends and everyone on the Earth, the experiment is over and our multi-legged miniature monsters are back. Bees and other insects are the building blocks of all ecosystems. It's a complete cycle and it's all so important to keep this planet working. As we emerge from the nightmare of a world without insects, we can look to a future filled with innovation thanks to our creepy crawly cohorts. There is so much more for us to learn from bees and bugs. Like incredible guidance systems. Dung beetles have a remarkable way of being able to navigate. They're actually looking up and making a mental snapshot so they can navigate by the moon or the sun or even the Milky Way. What scientists are looking at in terms of biomimicry is working out algorithms that can map and chart in the same sort of way so that we can drive our autonomous cars or use other tools of navigation. High-tech engineering continues to unlock secrets of our world, thanks to bugs. The beautiful blue wings of the morpho butterfly are actually colors that are produced by the texture of the surface of the insect and which diffract light. By studying the cone-shaped structures on the wing, we're learning to separate light at a very, very small scale. The way they reflect light and the way they deal with heat is something we're looking at carefully to make better solar panels. Nanoscale diffraction that separates light into its component wavelengths gives the peacock spider its incredible color and scientists' inspiration for revolutionary optical technology. And bugs continue to do jobs to make our lives safer, like bomb sniffing. Grasshoppers, like a lot of insects, have amazing antenna, which pick up uh, chemical compounds. And of course, explosives do have a residue that can be detected. Medical researchers continue to find new bug-derived treatments. We are learning enormous amounts about immunity and about ways of curing or preventing diseases through our study of bugs. Deathstalker scorpions secrete a venom that bonds to cancerous tissue. If you add fluorescent dye, you come up with essentially tumor paint. Researchers in the Netherlands have developed a surgical tool based on the egg-laying ovipositor of parasitic wasps, which could perform biopsies, deliver drugs, or even remove tumors in hard-to-reach areas. But a world without bees, bugs, and spiders could be much more than a thought experiment. Sadly, there's a growing body of evidence that insects are in rapid decline globally. That's something that should be of huge concern. They're pollinating, they're doing all that hard work of decomposition. They're doing all that invisible work that we really should start to pay attention to. Insects are the foundation of our ecosystem. And we should be trying to work hand in hand and hand and hand with the insects. I think if we start to really look at the way we grow our food, we could make some really big changes for insects on this planet. Insects will surround us, inspire us, feed us, guide and protect us as we venture into the future. We have this beautiful assemblage of 1.4 million species of plants and animals on this planet. It's amazing and we should celebrate it.